I hope that you'll be back tonight. I had nine stepfathers growing up. I was in jail by the time I was 15. I could cuss wallpaper off a wall. I'd make up bad words. I lived in bars and streets and alleys. My dad walked out of my life at four. Any way you could be abused, my sister and myself and my five other siblings were horribly abused. So if anybody here ought to be atheist or agnostic, it ought to be me. But 40, 44 years ago, I made a choice that changed my life, got saved, and we're never going to be the same. Now, I don't know what happened to some of y'all, but I'm going to tell you, I ain't got over my salvation yet. Some of us got over it. Maybe you never got it. So I'm going to give you a strong word today. If you turn your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, if you're in a hurry, you came the wrong Sunday. Of course, if you come back next Sunday, you came probably the wrong one <laughs> if you're in a hurry, because I don't think these people are in a hurry. It's been a great week. Tonight could be an incredible crowd. Now, if you're listening, say, I am. I am. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Everybody say, this yes. is a test. Yes. Say, final, final. exam. Yes. I call this the test of faith, and I need everyone to listen as best as you can. You need to understand that we live in a world, life, I believe life is a test full of pop quizzes. You need to make sure you that are sitting here, and some of you, it sounds like some of you got to work harder than the others, because we got somebody dying back there at the back. I don't know who's dying. I don't know if you're poking him or. I was in one church, and, uh, and um, they had these seats that folded, and I heard this baby screaming, and I, and I reckon it wasn't, it wasn't a normal cry. He had fallen between the seat and was crunched in between the seat. I'd have been crying too. So you never know. So if you're listening, say, I am. So for you that have your kids, I know that you're going to have to work hard to listen. And I want to say this to you. To come to this church every week and not to leave any different than you came, either we failed to do our job or you failed to listen. So if you're listening, say, I am. I am. So everybody say, this is a test, say final, final. Exam. exam. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to number one through five. In a moment, I'm going to give you five things that will prove that you're saved. Now, you need to listen close. If you get five out of five this morning, you can walk out of those doors knowing that you're saved. But you got to listen. If you get three out of five, if you get four out of five, I want you to understand that you failed the test, and you'll end up in hell. If you're listening, say, I am. See, God doesn't grade on the curve. Hello? How many of y'all know what a curve is in school? How many of y'all prayed for a curve in school? I just prayed for a fire. <laughs> curve wasn't going to help me. I mean, I studied all night to make a high F. Hello? And I, always, I would always sit behind these intellectual people. I made a 98. What did you make? And I was pumped about my 17. I'm thinking, I'm hoping you're studying to be a dentist. I'm going to bust your teeth out is what I'm going to do. But here's the deal. You need to listen close. If all five of these things, according to the Scripture, not me, if these five things happened in your life, then you can know that you're saved. And you need to listen close. Because I believe there's people in this room that have a religious God. They have a, real, you know, they have a, whatever, a, 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 maybe a works God or maybe a do-good God. Bottom line is you need to make sure that you're truly born again. And if you ever, if you ever know that, then you're going to worship different. You're going to serve different. You're going to love different. Uh, you know, they did, the, they did your offering for your tithe. And if everybody in this room gave like they should have, you'll build whatever you need to build. If everybody gives. But I'm going to tell you why we don't tithe, why we don't serve, why some of you will be here to, this morning and you won't be back till next Sunday. Are you ready? For you that won't be back till next Sunday, I'm not even sure that you love God. Everybody say hello. hello. See, I can make you mad and I don't really care. I didn't come to make you happy. We've come to make you holy. If I wanted to make friends, I'd give you money and we'd be done in about 20 minutes. We'd be friends. But, but you know what? God's called me not to make friends, but to make disciples. And if we become disciples of Jesus, we're going to become friends. Amen? If you're listening, say, I am. So say, this is a test, final exam. 
Now, when you number one through five, leave a little room so I could give you this, the statement, and I'm going to give you a scripture to back it up. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Would you go to verse 14? And you've got to listen close. Paul was concerned about the Corinthian church. They sound like a bunch of Baptists that couldn't get along. They argued over everything. They argued over the gift of the Spirit. They argued over the Lord's Supper. They just couldn't get along. So look what Paul did. Paul says, church, this is my third time. Look at this. I'm coming to you for a third time. Now, I do a lot of repeat stuff. That's a good thing. When people invite me back, that means, you know, God did something. Now, if I'm not getting invited back, either I messed up or they couldn't handle it. I don't know. But look at this. Paul says, church, I'm coming to you for a third time. Now, look at it. Look at what he says. I'm ready to visit you for a third time, and I will not be a burden to you. Now, watch this. When I pause, would you speak? By the way, the reason we're throwing that scripture up, it's for you that were too lazy to bring your Bible. Babies. We ought to get, by the way, we ought to just give people a pacifier and just say, yeah, go in and sit down and shut up. Are you ready? It says this. I don't want to be a burden to you because what I want is not your possessions. I don't want your money. What I want is, what I want is, everybody say, God wants me. Everybody point to yourself. Go ahead and do it. Say, God wants me. The best of me, the ugly of me. The good of me, the bad of me. Say, God wants me. Now look at what he said. I don't want to be a burden. Church, it's my third time here, and it's not your money. It's not your possessions. What I want is, what I need is, you know what I found out? You can give your money, you can give your time, you can give your talents without giving your life. You know what I found out? When God gets all of you, when he gets all of you, you're going to tithe. Man, your time is going to be his. Your talents will be used for his glory. So everybody say, God wants me. Now go, if you would, to verse 19. Turn to verse 19. Look at what he says. Paul says, church, perhaps, look at verse 19. You've been thinking all along, we've been defending ourselves to you. We've been speaking in the sight of God as those in Christ. And look at this. Get ready to speak. And everything we do, dear friends, is for your, mind says for, everybody say benefit. Say edification. Say building up. Say encouragement. Say strengthening. Now here's why we're doing this weekend. And here's the deal. The reason you guys have Sunday school, the reason you have Wednesday night church, the reason we do all of this, it's to strengthen, it's to benefit and bless your life. That's why we do this stuff. Keep reading. Look at verse 20. Look at verse 20. Look at that word. Everybody say, I'm afraid. You're going to see that phrase three times. Paul says, church, I'm afraid that when I come to visit you, I'm not going to find you as I want you to be, and you're not going to like, in other words, I'm not going to like what I see, and you ain't going to like what you hear. Everybody say, this is a test. Say, final exam. Keep going. I'm afraid that when I come to... We're not going to like each other. Then read on. He said, I'm afraid, look at this, I fear that there will be, everybody say quarreling. Say jealousy. Stronger. Say outburst of anger. Stronger. Say faction. Slander. Gossip. Arrogance. Say disorder. You know why I'm laughing at this? Guess who he's talking to? Sounds like a Baptist business meeting. Sounds like a youth group that can't get along. I'm not being ugly. This is the church. See, the problem is not prostitutes and prisoners. The problem is the people in the church. You better listen because the devil doesn't work from the outside in. He works from the inside out. We talked about weeds last night. If you're listening, say I am. So he said, we've got a problem. Look at the next verse, verse 21. Look at what he says. He says, I'm afraid that when I come again for the third time, there's that word fear again. I'm afraid that my God will humble me before you. I will grieve over many who have sinned earlier and still not repented of their impurity, their sexual, in, their sexual sin. I, I, that word, everybody said debauchery. Yeah, go to somebody tomorrow and say, man, you're looking pretty debauchery. 
Have you debaucherated lately? <laughs> Let me tell you what that means. Let me read it from mine. It says this. Many of you have sinned early, have not repented of your impurity, your sexual immorality, and your eagerness for lustful pleasure. That's what it means. I have five, at least five friends. Well, they're not my friends anymore, not because of my choice. I have five guys that were in the ministry. They gave up their marriages. They gave up their kids, gave up their grandkids, gave up all of that for an adulterous affair. Look at this. We've got a problem. And so Paul recognized it. He said, you know what? Maybe the reason you're jealous, maybe the reason you're, you're critical, maybe the reason you're always complaining, maybe, just maybe, you don't pass the test. Now, I wouldn't be a good pastor. I appreciate your pastor, but I wouldn't want to be one because I, I, I couldn't take it. Because a bunch of babies whining, crying. Somebody would come to me and complain, I'd slap you. I wouldn't vote on it, put it in the budget. I'd just kick you. I hate it when I hear these people come to the pastor. Well, one of these days I'm going to leave because I would say my prayers have been answered. Amen. Let me drive you to Dead Baptist Church down the street. I love this one. Well, I was here before you, and when the rapture comes, you're still going to be here. Can I get an amen? amen. So you need to understand this because and, and, God calls pastors and of course, you've got a different pastor. He's not your typical for sure. I've already figured that out. Which, which is a good thing. But watch this now. He says, church, my third time to be here. We're still not getting along. Watch this. We quarrel. We're arguing. There's gossip. There's deceit. There's impurity. He said, I know what the problem is. Go to chapter 13. And look at verse 5. Here it is. Man, I hope you're taking notes because you could write these five things in your Bible, but look at it. What's the very first two words? I'm sorry, what? I love the ones that are here going, dude, I didn't know we were going to have to talk in this thing. See, too many of y'all come to spectate rather than participate. You need to quit spectating in worship and participate. You need to not spectate in the Word. You need to participate. So if you're listening, say I am. What's the very first two words? Everybody say them. Examine who? Because I know what some of you all do. Somebody will walk in the church that hasn't been here in a while, and you'll do this. They're here. God, did you see them? They're right over there, God. Get them, God. Sick them. Examine who? Paul said, I want who? If you're listening, say I am. Look what he said. Examine yourselves and see whether or not you're in the. Everybody say born again. Born again. Say saved. Say. Now you've got to watch this. Look what Paul's saying. He's saying church. Maybe the reason you're critical. Maybe the reason you don't tithe. Maybe the reason you don't share your faith. Maybe the reason you don't have a passion for the word. Maybe the reason church doesn't mean that much to you. Maybe you've never been of the faith. Oh, keep going. Look at the very next two words. What does it say? Everybody say test, test. examine, examine. Try. try, say prove. prove. All the same words. He said, test yourselves. Look, don't you realize that Jesus Christ is where? Sorry, where? Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. Is in me. Dude, that's powerful. 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in than he that is in the world. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, yet not Christ, yet not I, but Christ lives in. Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Guys, do you know that the God of this universe, if you claim to be saved, lives in you? Dude, that's powerful. I was at the Grand Canyon one time with my two boys, my wife, and we were looking at this hole in the ground. Big honking hole. There it is. After 30 seconds, I'm ready to go. My grand, my kids thought it was the best thing. Finally, I, I looked at it. It was pretty awesome. I leaned over to my boys and I said, guys, did you know that my father, my daddy made that hole? Now the people next to us are now listening. 
And the guy next to me, I'm not lying, said this to me. He said, sir, who's your daddy? I said, my daddy is God. His son is my Savior. And my daddy made that. They, they left. They left. I don't know who you think did Niagara Falls, my daddy. You see, so Paul says, church, examine yourselves. Make sure you're saved. Test yourselves. Make sure that Jesus is in. Now watch this. Unless, of course, you, I'd underline that word. Unless, of course, you, I had a pastor. I preached this at his church a couple of times. He called me a, a few months ago. He said, um, would you mind if I preach that message? I said, dude, put the bullets in your gun and shoot it. This message, I promise you, I could preach. If I went to a church, I could preach six times in a row. We would see some incredible things. Look at this. Unless indeed you, everybody say fail. Here's what the word means. Everybody say disqualified. Pastor, here's what Paul's saying. He said, you better make sure you're of the faith. You better make sure Jesus is in you, in you because if you don't, when you get to heaven, you're going to be disqualified. A friend of mine <laughs> used to run two miles. I don't know why people want to run two miles when you can take your car. <laughs> I used to run three miles a day. I now take my car. I feel better. I get there faster. Are you ready for this? He was the, the fifth fastest runner in Texas in high school. His senior year, his prayer, his goal, his desire was being the top three because in Texas, if you're in the top three in your event, you make it to the state, state meet. He's about fourth or fifth and even sixth. And so the day of the race came, man, he prayed. He worked hard in every work. And he was the dude that would take off and kind of be the rabbit. In other words, he would set the pace. If you watch some of these long races, you'll see this guy, and they set the pace, and eventually they just drop out of the race. Some of them hold on. This dude never dropped out. And what would happen is at the end of the race, three or four guys would blow by him, and he'd be in fourth or fifth place. The day the race started, got his numbers in his lane. His coach is up in the, the press box, and the race starts, and he takes off. Now, he hadn't, he hadn't gone maybe 50 yards. It's a two-mile run. And one of the um, um, officials said, who's number so-and-so? And the dude said, that's, that's Ron. That's, he's my guy. He's my runner. And the official said to, his, to the coach, your runner has just been disqualified. Now I'll tell you why in a little bit. So Ron runs the race. He's coming around the last lap, and he usually he feels people on him. But when he kind of looked back, they weren't that close, and he just took off. He didn't finish Third, fourth, he finished first. Crossed the finish line first. I mean, people went crazy. These guys he had never beaten in four years of running against them, he beat them. His parents came out of the crowd. People are, it was a big deal. And then the coach walked out onto the track, and he walked up to Ron, and he wasn't smiling. Ron said, Coach, I don't know where you were, but I won. He said, Ron, I don't know how to tell you this, but you've been disqualified. He said, Coach, why? I ran the race. I stayed in my lane. I did everything right. And he said, Ron, when the race started, one of the officials said, who's that runner? I said, he's mine. He said, he's disqualified. And I said, why? And here's what he said. Because, coach, there's nothing I can do about it. The race has already started. You failed to write his name down in the official book as one of the runners. And because his name was not in the, he was disqualified. Are you ready? You better make sure your name's in the book. Are you ready? So everybody say, this is a test? test. Say final exam. final exam. Number one, write it down. Here we go. If I was you, man, if I was you and I was here, I would make sure as you go through these five things that all of them happen in your salvation. Here's the first thing that should have happened when you got saved. Are you ready? Everybody, everybody say, the Holy Spirit starts salvation. Now write that down. Are you ready for this? Now, hyper-Calvinists love me when I go here. Anybody know what a hyper-Calvinist is? If you don't, don't worry about it. I predestined myself not to be a hyper-Calvinist. Now, here's the deal. <laughs> Only a few of you got that. That's good. Are you ready? No one can be saved if the Spirit of God doesn't start it. 
His job and my job. Listen, we, we can convince you, Daniel can convince you that you need a Savior, but it's the Spirit's job to convict you. Are you listening? If you are, say, I am. So here's what you've got to do. You've got to go back and look at when you were saved. Can the Holy Spirit deal with an eight-year-old, yes or no? Yes. Oh, I believe that. But here's what bothers me. I meet people who were saved at 8, 9, and 10. Now they're 18, 28, and 58 and don't give a rip about God. Can I tell you why? They probably never got saved. Dude, I'm, listen, I'm more, I'm more radical for Jesus than when I first got saved. I think it's getting worse. See, here's the bottom line. You need to go back to your salvation. And you need to make sure that the Spirit of God started it. Write these scriptures down. John 6, says this. No one can come to God unless the Spirit of God draws him. See, and I'm not being ugly. It means I'm getting ready to be. For you that came this morning without your Bible, I'm not being ugly. I'm thinking, what were you thinking? I mean, if you go to the grocery store, you better have check, a cash, or credit card, or guess what you're going to get? If you get in your car, you better have car keys and gas, or guess where you're going to go? You see, this Bible ought to be the checkbook, the credit card, and the cash in your life. This, this Bible ought to be the keys and the gas that propels you. So I don't know what you're thinking, but coming to church, it just looks good if you bring your Bible. Hello? We ought to, have, we ought to charge people for not bringing their Bible. You could, you could raise some money. $500 a pop. Hallelujah. You're listening. Say, I am. Yes. So everybody say, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. starts salvation. Start salvation. John 6, says this. It says, no one can come to God unless the Spirit of God draws them. John 16, write it down, verses around 5 through 8 says this. Jesus says, fellas, you, don't even, you haven't even asked why I'm leaving or even where I'm going. And Jesus said this, his own words. He said, I've got to go to be with the Father, because if I don't go, then the, are you listening? The Holy Spirit won't come. And here's the Spirit's job. The, Spirit of, the Holy Spirit's job is to convict us, everybody say, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Romans 8, 16 says, the Spirit of God bears witness that we're a child of God. So I want you to understand, when you mess up, when you mess up or when I mess up, and there's no conviction, you may not be saved. Dude, I'm going to tell you, I can look at somebody the wrong way and the Spirit of God will convict me. I can have a bad attitude and the Holy Spirit instantly convicts me. Now, i got to stop here. I was in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Central Baptist Church, it was my third time to be there. I preached this message on Sunday morning. I preached Sunday night, I preached Monday night, and then Tuesday rolled around. And on Tuesday night, I had a message I wanted to preach, and God began to speak to me through the worship, and here's what God said. He said, I want you to preach the test, what you preach Sunday morning, you need to preach it again. And I said to God, God, probably more than half these people have already heard it, like he didn't know. So I got up on Tuesday night, 1,300 people or more. And I said, church, I'm not sure why I'm doing this, but I'm just going to obey God. I'm going to preach what I preach Sunday morning. I got plenty of messages. And I started off Tuesday night, the Holy Spirit starts salvation. And there was a young man sitting on the second row. And as soon as I said the Holy Spirit starts it, he stood up, grabbed his youth pastor, and left. Now I'll tell you what happened in a little bit. If you're listening, say I am. So here's the bottom line. You've got to go back and look at when you were saved. Because I'll ask people, hey, are you a Christian? And I get these answers. Well, I'm a Catholic. Hey, are you a Christian? Well, I go to that Baptist church. Hey, are you a Christian? I've been christened, dipped, dunk, sprinkled. I've been baptized three or four times. Hey, are you a Christian? I'm a good person. So you need to understand, when I ask if you were saved, who started your salvation? See, some of us got saved because a group of people walked forward. Some of us got saved to make somebody happy. If the Spirit of God did not start, and I'm going to tell you right now, in this room, there are people, by the way, 
if you don't get five out of five, you fail the test. And if you miss number one, you better pray that number one happens in your life before you leave this place. Amen? Number two, write it down. Say the Holy Spirit starts salvation. Here's the second thing that happened in your salvation. Everybody say lost. Now write it down. You see, when you... When the Spirit of God begins to convict you, you're going to realize you are. Romans 3.23 says, For all have, for all have, the Pope has, Billy Graham has. I really believe Joel Osteen has sinned. I really do. As happy as he is, I believe he's messed up. Nobody ought to be that happy. Are you ready? For all have. You need to listen close. All of us in this world were born lost, separated. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says that we were born dead and doomed because of our sin. So you need to look. By the way, it's happening right now. The Holy Spirit will convict you and you'll realize that you are, everybody say lost. Here's the definition of lost. This will help you. Everybody say without a Savior. You're going to realize that Jesus is not your Savior because you are not bad. You're, you don't go to hell because you're bad. You go because you're, don't go to hell because you're a homosexual or an alcoholic or a swindler. You go to hell because you're, in fact, let me go ahead and tell you, hell's going to be full of a bunch of good people. How many of y'all know good people that are not saved? You know what scares me, Pastor? I know good people that are better than most saved people. You know what they say? Why do I need your God? I got good. My marriage is better. My kids are better. My morals are better. I mean, you guys can't even get along. Because good won't get you to heaven. Everybody say, Holy Spirit, start salvation. Everybody say, lost. Say, without a Savior. Say, spiritually ruined. This is the biggie. Say, unable to help yourself. When you come to a point and you, and, and you realize that he's not your Savior, you realize that you can't help yourself, that you're spiritually ruined, then you can be saved. Everybody say Holy Spirit. Everybody say lost. Now, before I go any further, everybody say doubt. How many of y'all have ever doubted your salvation? Raise your hand. Are you ready? I used to say this. It was so stupid. I used to say if you're 99% sure that you're saved, you're probably 100% lost. Can I go ahead and tell you? If you're 99% sure you're saved, you're probably saved. Even Billy Graham doubted his salvation. I'm going to tell you why we doubt. Doubt does not mean that you're lost. Are you ready? This is a great statement. The reason we doubt God is when we stop doing for God. Now, you're going to watch. I don't believe works save you, but I do believe this. We were created for good works. And our works don't save us, but our works show people that we're saved. Are you ready? Everybody say doubt. Man, I'd write it down because here's the deal. By the way, guess who creates doubt? You think God's going, this will mess them up. 1 John 5, 13 says these things were written that you might know you have everlasting life. Everybody say doubt. So the reason we doubt God is when we stop doing. Are you ready? When I obey God, when I'm loving my wife, when I'm serving God, when I'm, when I'm on my face, when I'm worshiping, when I'm really living Jesus, I'll never doubt Him. So everybody say, Holy Spirit, start salvation. Lost without a Savior. Now i got to go here. I don't think you got to remember every single thing when you got saved. But can I go ahead and say this? You better remember when you got saved. I was married August 17, 1972. 2220 Northwest Military Highway, Castle Hills, First Baptist Church. It was on a Thursday night at 6.30. I kind of remember saying I do. October of 1968, you'll hear my story tonight. October of 1968, on a Wednesday night, I, gave, I said I do to Jesus. There are two dates, men, you better remember when you better you better remember when you got married and when you got saved. Because if you forget the first, there's not going to be a rapture. 
If you're married, raise your hand. I've learned three magical truths to be married for 40 years. Men, I've learned you can be happy in a marriage or you can be right. How many men have chosen to be happy? Raise your hand. And if you ain't raising your hand, you're stupid. Because when my wife ain't happy, God ain't happy. I've learned another magical truth. What's mine is hers. And what's hers? I've learned these, these two statements I almost start every day with. I need all the men to say, all the married men, say it's my fault. She runs out of gas, you're not even in the car. Say it, guys. She writes a check at Walmart, should have never written. Say it, guys. Your kids turn into idiots one day. I'll wake up every now and then. I'll wake my wife up and say, babe, before I go get you a cup of coffee, I need to say, I want to start my day right. Anything that happens today, it's my fault, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you I'm sorry. <laughs> if you're listening, say I am. So everybody say the Holy Spirit. Start salvation. Lost without a Savior. Here's the third thing. Everybody say faith. Say saving faith. Write that down. Are you ready? This is how it worked, Pastor. Whether you were 8, 18, or 80, the Holy Spirit began to deal with you. And all of a sudden, you realize you were, you were separated from God because of your sin. Then, then Jesus said, you know what? Now that you've realized you're lost, I want to give you faith. Now, we looked at this the other night. Oh, by the way, remember the dude that left on point one? He came back on point three. Walked in on the stage. I had a handheld mic. Grab the mic from my hand. That's like grabbing my TV changer, my phone, or a fork. And he grabbed the mic out of my hand, and the church was packed. There was a balcony. And I knew, and he was crying. The youth guy was crying. And he walked up to the stage, and he said, Mom and Dad, they were in the balcony. Would you please stand? That's where they've sat all their life. He said, Mom and Dad, I'm 18 years old, and I want you to know that I've, I've never had sex. I've never done drugs. I've never tasted alcohol, never smoked a cigarette. Dad, I don't cuss. In fact, Dad, since about the fifth grade, I've never lied to you. <laughs> I kind of freaked out. Because I'm thinking if we're going to clone something, forget the sheep. <laughs> Let's clone that dude right there. Are you ready for this? Look at me. He said, Dad, I know you saw me leave. And I'm going to tell you why I left. This has only happened four or five times when I preach this. He said, Dad, Brother Ken said if you get four out of five or three out of five, you fail the test. And here's what he said. He said, Dad, I already failed, number one. Why should I stay for the rest when I've already failed? He said, Dad, 20 minutes ago with my youth pastor, I just got saved. Are you ready? Here's what he said. He said, Dad, I would sit in that balcony where you've sat for years. When I was nine years old, you would pray every Sunday, God save my son. I never prayed that for my boys where they could hear me. Because if you pray that long enough, they're going to want to do it. You know what? I, I always pray, God, become real to my boys. And that's salvation. God, change their hearts. This dude, God, save my son. God, here's what he said. Dad, I made up my mind at nine that if you prayed that again, I was going to stand up and get saved. And I didn't even know what it meant. Sure enough, invitation came. You said, God save my son. I stood up. And when I stood up, you and mom started crying. I started crying. They asked me to come to the front. I walked to the front. I filled out a card. Went in the back, prayed some prayer, and got in the baptistry. Here's what he said. He said, Dad, I realized this morning on the second row that when I was nine years old, it wasn't the Spirit of God that started my salvation. I got saved. For you. I gave my life to God for you and mom. But this morning, I got saved because the Spirit of God revealed to me that I was lost. Everybody say faith. Say saving faith. 
If you were here uh, on Friday night, say I was. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Ephesians 2, 8 says this. It's by grace that you are saved through, which is not of your, that any, any man should boast of his works, but faith is a, are you ready for this? Please don't stop listening. Ephesians 2, 8 says that faith is a gift. Are you ready? Because you're looking at a guy that was beat, I mean, broomsticks, belts, switches. Mom held a knife to my throat more than once, threatened to kill us all the time. And I want you to understand, 44 years ago, I knew nothing about the Bible, knew nothing about God. I, in fact, to be honest with you, I thought God gave me a bad deal. And 44 years ago, I realized I was, and God gave me saving. And here's what it, everybody say, I believe. Jesus loves me, died for me, buried, rose again, coming again, did it for me. Didn't deserve it, couldn't buy it, but I believe it. You need to look at me. Salvation is not about walking an aisle. Salvation is not about getting in a baptistry. Salvation is not about joining a church. Listen, if you join the church, ain't going to make you a Christian. If I join the Girl Scouts, they're going to make me a girl. And according to my daughter, I'd be an ugly girl. My granddaughter, look at me. Are you ready for this? Salvation starts in your, that's where it starts. Now, I know some of you went up to use the bathroom and some of you went and did. Do you understand that every time you get up, whether it's with your kid or for whatever, and I'm just telling you this, do you understand that, the, that I realize that you probably are not listening. Now, I'm not being ugly. See, I can say that. In fact, the other night, in my, our pastor, because we've got people coming and going. I mean, we, we flip-flop about 6,000 people. And at the very end of his service, people start getting up and running to their car. So when I got to preach, I said, let me just tell you this. Ain't nobody leaving till I'm done. And nobody left. Do you understand that this dude, do you understand that your pastors, they pray, they seek God, and Sunday comes. Man, don't leave till it's over. So here's the deal. The Holy Spirit starts salvation. you got to realize you are without a Savior. All of a sudden, God gives you saving. Here's number four. We're almost done. Number five is automatic. For you that are taking medicine, let me help you. It's 11.55. Everybody look at your watch. Let's all do it. Everybody do it together. Everybody look. Now we've all done it. We don't have to do it again. We've done it together. I mean, how would you like it if he preached every Sunday? And the Bible says, God loves you and God has a, I don't even know why I wear a watch. I just look at it. It looks really nice. My wife said, why do you have a watch? I said, I don't know. Are you ready for this? Everybody say, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Lost. Lost. Saving faith. Saving. Here's number four. We're almost done. Everybody say, almost done. almost done. Everybody say, repentance. I need everybody looking this way. my boys were able to go to church, we had a law. The law was you couldn't leave until the service was over. See, I watched some of these guys walk out to go get a drink, walk to go, get, go to the bathroom, and I'm just going to tell you, it shouldn't be happening. Because do you understand when that happens, and I'm not being, I know there's exceptions to the rule. If you're pregnant here today, leave any time you want to leave. <laughs> Ain't nothing like a mad pregnant woman, I'm just telling you you got a reason to leave. So I'm assuming anybody leaving from here on out is pregnant. And the first man to leave, I will acknowledge you. Do, do, do you feel me? Do you hear what I'm saying? Guys, I'm not getting anything extra for saying that. If I didn't care, I wouldn't say it. Everybody say repentance. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I want them to throw this up and go to verse 10. Verse 10 and 11. 
Before I read it, I want, I want everybody to say repentance. I want to give you, Pastor, this is the truest definition of what repentance is. Now, you got to write it down. Everybody say repentance is a change. Three things. Say a change of mind, a change of direction, and a change of purpose. Let's do it again. Everybody say repentance is a change of mind. That's how you think. Say direction. That's how you walk. Say purpose. That's how you live. Are you ready for this? How many of you know people who say they're saved, but nothing changed? Can I tell you why? They never got saved. Repentance is a change. Everybody say change. That's like a cuss word in most churches. You want to what? Move. Build another building in a field. Put up on a screen. Where's the pulpit? Drums. What if, we're, we don't have any pews. I didn't even see a bulletin this morning. You don't have one? Somewhere? Well, who's got one? Let me see one. You got one? Let, let me see. Let, let me see the bulletin. You're grabbing your pocket. <laughs> He's trying to help me, though. See, here's the deal. Are you ready? Can I tell you what's cool about this? I've got my picture. <laughs> I'm real close to Beth Moore, but here's the deal. Are you ready for this? You know what's cool? Remember what he said? Everything we do is to benefit you. All this stuff is for you. Because if all you're doing is coming Sunday morning, you need to find another church. You see, there, this bulletin, it took somebody time. Now, there's not an order of service in here, praise God. Yeah, there you go. Can I tell you this? This is to help you get involved with the body of Christ. Amen? Everybody say repentance. is a change of mind direction, and purpose. See, I'm going to just tell you this. When you get saved, everything changes, and it changes. How many of y'all don't like change? Be honest. Raise your hand. Really? Are y'all ready? Everybody in this room likes change. I'm going to prove it to you. Y'all ready? How many of you have a microwave oven in your house? How many of y'all remember when you didn't? Everybody say, change. How many of y'all remember Jiffy Pop popcorn? <laughs> and you burn it. Walmart still sells it. Everybody say change. How many of y'all have a refrigerator with an ice maker? How many of y'all remember when you had the trays and you'd take it out, run it underneath the water, slam it on the counter? Go get tray number two, and it's empty. Everybody say change. How many of y'all can get cubed iced and crushed out of, out of your refrigerator? Everybody say change. How many of you know what an eight track is? It's probably the dumbest thing we ever created. They never work. Young people, if your parents talk about eight tracks, they're a redneck. <laughs> we went from eight tracks to CDs to DVDs to cassette. Listen, change is good. How many of y'all remember Nintendo? Atari. Now we've got the Wii. Everybody say, we. How many of you, rem how many of y'all have a remote control TV changer? Everybody say, change. Do you remember the first remote control changer? Here it is. Son, will you go change it? Did you hear her? I said, she went, I was. Do you remember? Stand, stand right there with the rabbit ears. 
Everybody say G. How many of you have a flat screen TV? Remember the big ones? Big! If you're listening, so I am. How many of you have a different hairstyle than you used to have? I'd never point anybody out. But there's a day that dude had hair. Look at me. I want everybody to look. Guys, do you understand that our clothes styles have changed? Glasses have changed. I mean, there was a day we didn't have contacts. I wear them. See, here's the deal. Shame, if you get a computer today, in three days it's shame. You know what's sad, Pastor? We love change everywhere in our life, but in the church. If you want this church to be great, change your methods. Not the message. Hey, I probably could have wore shorts this morning. Wouldn't have, wouldn't have mattered. I'm sure there was a couple of y'all, can you believe that? Dude, if wearing shorts is going to mess you up, you came the wrong place. I got good looking legs anyway. Everybody say change. Say, repentance is a change of mind, direction, and purpose. If you're getting this, say, I'm getting it. Because, see, this message, Pastor, is, I promise you, is the most solid message you'll ever hear on being saved. Because I believe you can know it. Look at what he says. Godly sorrow. Are you ready? Godly sorrow brings what? Let's put my definition there. Godly sorrow brings a change of Mine, a change of direction, and a change of, oh, watch this, that leads to, because when you repent, you're going to get saved. You're going to think different, talk different, walk different, love different. Man, dude, you're looking at a guy, I was an introvert. I was a loner. I studied all night to make a high F. I had, an, I had an athlete's foot one time. I don't know if that makes me an athlete. <laughs> Thought about being a cowboy, but those are weird people. Some people smoke cigarettes. Cowboys eat them. Look at me. And when I got saved, I, ha I haven't had a beer. I haven't had drugs. haven't had a cigarette. That stuff's been in my life for 40 years. Because when you get saved, everything, let's look at it. Godly sorrow produces what? That leads to? Leaves no. But worldly sorrow brings? Can I read it from mine? Let me read it from mine. Listen. This is what it says here. Listen. For God can use sorrow in our lives to help us turn away from sin. Everybody say repent. And seek salvation. We will never regret that kind of sorrow. But sorrow without repentance leads to death. Are you all listening? Guys, I'm not preaching long just to preach long. See, I'm going to be in church a whole lot more than you. I've been preaching since last Saturday. I'm talking about yesterday, a week ago. I will preach every day from Saturday till, the, till, till through the next Wednesday. And I finally get a couple days off. Here's the bottom line. Paul says, church, you better make sure you're of the faith. You better make sure Jesus in, is in you, or unless indeed you will be disqualified. Everybody say repentance. repentance. It's a change. And notice what he says. A person that's truly repentant, they have no, no regret. I've never met anybody that got saved and said this. What was I thinking? I was going to go to hell. Now I'm going to heaven. I was going to be with Marilyn Manson and Charles Manson, Lady Gaga, and some country western singer. But now I'm going to heaven. Borny's probably going to be there. I don't even like purple. Are you ready for this? I've never in my life met anybody that truly got saved and regretted it. But I have met a lot of people that regretted not getting saved. If I say the name Mickey Mantle, 
you know the name Sadhu. Mickey Mantle, the game of baseball. In Sports Illustrated 1995, listen to this. Mickey Mantle was about to die. About three, four, five weeks before he died, he called in Bobby Richardson, who was a coach in baseball today. Bobby Richardson played second base for the Yankees when Mickey Mantle joined. Even Babe Ruth was there. And Bobby witnessed to these guys, and he, he offered Mickey Mantle Jesus. And rather than pick up the Bible like Babe Ruth, he picked up a bottle of booze, and he became a womanizer and a drunk. In fact, Mickey Mantle said this. He said, I was a great drinking buddy to my sons, but I was a lousy dad. He said to little boys, play ball like me, but whatever you do, don't be like me. He called, Mickey, he called Bobby in. Bobby Richardson walked, walked into his hospital room, and here's what Mickey Mantle said. He said, Bobby, you remember when you uh, shared God with me? He said, Al, I do. He said, I've got one regret in my life. Not that I hit more home runs. Not that I would be a better dad or grandfather or player. He said, my regret is, is that I never received Christ then. And here's what Mickey Mantle said three weeks before he died. He said, could I get saved now? And Bobby Richards, and by the way, I've met people who were involved in this, in this story. I've met them. And nobody could believe it happened. And Bobby led Mickey Mantle to the Lord three weeks before he died. But here's the sad part of Mickey Mantle. He died with a lot of regrets. He never got to be the Christian. He never got to be the daddy. He never got to be the really the role model. But he is in heaven today. Repentance is a shame. Here's number five and we're done. Everybody say Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Start, salvation. Start salvation. Lost, Lost. Without, a without a Savior. All have sinned. All have sinned. Say saving faith. saving faith. Faith is a gift. Is a gift. Say repentance, repentance is a change. And here's number five, and we're done. If all four of those things happen in your life, number five was automatic. Everybody say, not guilty, not guilty. Forgiven. forgiven, forever. forever. Let me say it again. Say, not guilty, not guilty. Forgiven. forgiven, forever. Let me give you two passages. Write down Acts 531, write it down, and Acts 1043. Acts 531 and Acts 1043. Now, don't stop listening. Look at me, unless you're writing. Somebody going to come play guitar real quick, yeah? And then we'll, we'll sing some more. I'm in no hurry. Ain't got nowhere to go. I probably could do without lunch. I want everybody listening. And I know it's, maybe it's just me hot in here. I feel some air somewhere. Most of the babies have kind of calmed down. Almost everybody's stopped kind of going to the bathroom. I believe people go to church. I just drove by about 10 churches to get here. And I believe this with all my heart. We got people that go to church every week and they're lost. Oh, they work in our church? In both of my books, I share a lot of stories. I could tell you story after story after story of pastors, worship singers, youth pastors that were lost. They never pass the test. So here's my question. If your heart were to stop, if you were to die, don't answer out loud. According to God's word, not Ken Freeman, according to God's word, five out of five, did you pass the test? Now, if you were saved Friday night, you were saved last night, and you believe God saved you, you passed the test. Look at me, Mom, Dad, there's some people in this room. You're, you're no more saved than this table. You know why you don't have, why many of you won't pick up this Bible? 
You won't pick it up maybe for two or three weeks. You know why you won't share your faith? You know why you won't, I mean, I mean, witness to other people, why, why you won't obey, why, why you won't get involved in the church? What? I'm going to tell you why. Probably you fail the test. So my question, if your heart were to stop, if you were to die, fair question. Fair question. Do you know that you're saved? Every head bowed, every eye closed. As still as you can be, nobody looking around. As still as you can be, counselors, you just need to begin to pray. I'm going to ask two questions. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. How many sitting here would say, if my heart were to stop, if I were to die? Nobody looking, just me. Now, you've got to look at the test and examine you. Nobody looking around. Maybe something clicked today, and, and you're saying, you know what, Brother Ken? Now I know why I don't have a passion. Now I know why I, I, I'm just not consistent with my walk. Now, I told you doubting doesn't mean you're lost, but I'm going to tell you this. If there's consistent doubt in your life over and over and over, there's a chance you're lost. So every head bowed, every eye closed. How many sitting here can honestly say, Brother Ken, if my heart were to stop, if I were to die, this morning I passed the test. I got five out of five, and I know I'm saved. Would you raise your hand? God, I'd be careful. I'd be so careful. Put them down. Second question, I'm not going to come grab you or follow you. I just want to pray for you. But how many sitting here would say, if my heart were to stop, if I were to die? Nobody looking but me. How many would be honest enough, mom, dad, I was at a church in Alabama, 78-year-old grandpa, a deacon in the church, supposedly a godly man, came forward that morning and stood in front of the church and said to his wife, his kids, his grandkids, I've been living a lie. I got saved when I was little just because a bunch of my friends did. And today, he said, I'm saved. Second question. How many sitting here would say, if my heart were to stop, if I were to die? Brother Ken, I didn't pass the test. I didn't get five out of five. I failed the test. Would you pray for me right now? Come on. Put your hands up all over this place. Come on, throw them up. High. Come on, put them up high. Mom, Dad, the very back, I see you. To the right, my left, put them up. All right, put them down. I want to make sure you understand, some of you didn't raise your hand to either question. So maybe God's not dealing with you. Maybe He's done. See, some of you, maybe you don't need God, and you'll never know you need God till you need God. So let me ask it again. If you're here this, this morning and you failed the test, whether it's two of them, three of them, I don't care, but how many sitting here would say, Brother Ken, I failed the test this morning. Would you pray for me? If that's you, raise your hand one more time. Come on, put them up high. Put them up high all over this place. Come on, sir. Mom, Dad, drop your pride. It'll change your marriage. It'll change the way you think. Put them down. And you that raised your hands to say, Brother Ken, I failed the test. You know what happened? You that just raised your hand, the Holy Spirit has convicted you that you're lost. That's why you raised your hand. You're not bad. You're lost. And now that you've realized that you're lost, God says, I want to give you faith. Everybody say, I believe. He loves me. Jesus died for me. Buried. Rose again. Coming again. What he did on the cross, he did for my sin. He loves me. Do you know, if you can believe those things by faith, he said, I'll save you. 
So if you can believe that, you guys that said, Brother, can I fail the test? If right now you can believe those things, now the Bible says you need to repent. So we're going to pray a prayer of repentance together. The prayer we're about to pray, it's not a magical prayer. It's not a get out of jail card. This prayer should be a confession of your heart. Are you ready? If you'd like to be saved, would you pray this with me right now? Come on, sir. Mom, dad, drop your pride. Young lady, church member, visitor, pray this with me right now. Just say, Jesus, I failed the test. Jesus, I've realized today that I'm lost. Come on, say it, sir. I don't care what my wife, my husband, I don't care what my kids, I don't care what anybody says. Jesus, I believe today I'm lost because of my sin. Hey, Jesus, thank you for faith. Because, Jesus, I believe that you love me. I believe you died for me. I believe you forgave me of my sins on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Now say this, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin, and I repent. Change my direction, how I walk. Change my mind today, how I think. And change my purpose, how I live. Say it. I receive you into my life. And with my lips, I call you Lord. Thank you for saving me. Now, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you prayed that with me, now you need to listen. If that prayer was your heart, God just saved you. Nobody looking but me. If you prayed that with me just now, raise your hands. Come on, put them up. Put them up high. Come on, all over this place. Come on. You believe that he saved you just now? Put them up. Unashamed. Unafraid. Put them down. I'm going to count to three. The Bible says in Matthew 10, Mark 8, and Luke 9, if you're not ashamed of me and my words, if you can confess me before men, I'll confess you to my Father. Are you ready? You that said, Brother Ken, God just saved me. As I count to three, I'm going to ask you to stand, remain standing with your head bowed. Are you ready? Because if you can't stand here with people that will love you, you ain't ever going to stand out there. Are you ready? If you prayed that with me just now, that was your heart. Don't wait for me to count to three. Stand up right now. Come on. All over this room, stand up. Come on. If you believe God saved you this morning, stand up right now. Mom, dad, teenager, church member. Don't look around. One, two. And I'll not count again. Come on. If you believe God saved you, don't sit there any longer. Stand up as I say three right now. One more. One more. And you that are standing, look at me. I want you to look at me. You're saying, Brother Ken, I don't know what I did before, but this morning, God saved me. So you that are standing, look at me. I want you to come stand right here and face me at the front of this church. Come on. Just face me right here. Unashamed, unafraid, right here. Right here. Unashamed, unafraid, right here. Come on. Unashamed and unafraid. This dude's got Jesus on his shirt. He's now got Jesus in his life. He's going to be a better dad, a better husband. He's going to be a better worker. And you that are standing here, look at me. Only you and God know if you meant business. So I'm going to start here and work my way around. And if you believe God saved you today, just nod your head. This is not a recommitment. Counselors, this is not a rededication. This is salvation. My son was one. Prayed a prayer at eight. 
Got him wet in the baptistry, got saved at 16. Would you bow your heads, church? Would you look up? Look up. This is salvation. Now, you understand here. Now, counselors, you got to listen to me close. These people said they were saved today. They raised their hand, acknowledged they were lost. They prayed to receive Christ. They stood, came forward to tell you and him, I got saved. Now, counselors, I don't know if we're going to have enough. So I, I need as many as we can have. Here's what we need you to do. Record their decision. Write down they were saved. You that are standing here. If you go to another church, we'll get this card to another church. But if you don't, this church would love to be your church. More than anything. Now, I'm, I'm going to guess. I'm going to need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. This married couple right here? Oh, not yet. Getting close. That's all right. You got Jesus right. Everything else will get right. I need about 16 women to head to the back that are going to help with counseling. 16 ladies. 16. At least maybe 17. And when these ladies come back, I want you to grab one of them, record their decision, and rejoice with them. Okay? So all the women that are standing here, would you make your way down that aisle right there? Just turn around and go down that aisle. Just the ladies. Men, stay here. Ladies, head that way. Clap for them one more time. Men, scoot up, men. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 12, 30, 14, 15, 16. About 17 men go to the back. Do you realize that we've had about, what we have, 23 saved to this point? About 35 or 36 today. Our goal was 100. We could see that tonight. It's going to be amazing. So I need about 17 men. All right, gentlemen, would you turn and go down that aisle? Head down that aisle. Now, Remain standing with your heads bowed. Tonight I'm going to share my story. And I hope that you'll bring some people back that have gone through rejection, divorce, abuse. Because I'm going to give some answers tonight. Now I want to ask this question. How many of you would say, Brother, can I pass the test? Raise your hand. I know I'm saved. Hold them up. I know I'm saved, okay? Now put them down. But how many of you would say, Brother Ken, I passed the test, but I'm not doing good with the pop quizzes in my life? Be honest. Brother Ken, I'm not being the husband. I'm not being the witness. I'm not being the son, the daughter. I'm not being the church member. Brother Ken, I know I'm saved, but I'm not doing good with the quizzes. Pray for me. Raise your hands. Come on, be honest. Hold them up high. You know what I'm going to ask you to do? You see, they repented to be saved. Philippians says that we work out our salvation. So I'm going to ask you that aren't doing good with the quizzes, step out from your seat right now and come kneel all across the front of this stage and say, God, I want to repent. I want to be the husband. I want to be the wife. I want to be the church member. I want to be the witness. 
I want to be the light. God, I want a passion for your word. I repent. Help us. Come on. Step out. Repent. God, change my direction, my mind, and my purpose. Sing it with us. Come on. Help us, church. Cry out to him. This is the good part. 